Welcome, everyone, and thanks for, for being here. First of all, I want to say happy International Women's Day to everybody in the room, specifically to the women. Um, the talk is called originally what we talk about when we talk about distributed systems, but that wouldn't fit on the website, so it had a new title, whatever it is that you see on your program. My name is Alvaro. I'm from Uruguay. I live in Switzerland currently. I work there remotely for a um, big company from, San Fran from Sunnyvale, but I cannot say which one. Pick your guess. Uh, before, I used to be a core developer for RabbitMQ. And before that, I used to build one of the biggest dating sites in, in, for Germany. We were based in China, so from China, we made that website for, for the Germans. So, you may wonder why these weird colors. This talk is also called Distributed Systems for the IKEA family. The talk was originally given in Sweden. That's the reason for this name. If you think you may invest your time at a different track, this is your last chance because there you can find the whole blog post with a transcription of the, of the talk, slides and whatnot. And finally, this talk is dedicated to Peter. He was a great friend. He passed away last year. Uh, we were always like arch enemies on the MQ space with Serial MQ, Rabbit MQ. So this talk is always uh, for Peter. So distributed systems. We have kind of this um, from the book definition, which is a distributed system is, is one in which the failure of a computer you did not even though existed, can render your own computer unusable. This uh, quote that you probably heard thousands of times, maybe some people attributed to Joe Armstrong from the Allen community. It's not, it's from Lamport. Uh, maybe it's from Abraham Lincoln, who knows? But that's kind of the definition, that there will be some computer that will break your system and you have no idea that that computer was there. Somewhere, this happens every time Facebook like buttons go down, the internet completely crashes. And what we did as developers is to make sure that GitHub that was distributed became completely centralized, or Git actually. So that's how good we are when dealing with distributed problems. We centralize everything, single point of failure, woo, we can go play ping pong at the, at the company. Anyway, why this talk? The problem I found when trying to learn about distributed systems is that there is a lot of jargon. There is a lot of these special words or expressions that are used in a, by a particular profession or group and are difficult for others to understand. But you may wonder, yeah, but I'm a software developer, what will be difficult for me? As you will see, there are many things, many words here that they don't mean what they mean in other areas of, of computing, let's say. So when, from the basic levels, distributed system, there are many nodes that could be called processes, and they are all used together to solve a single problem. Another key part of distributed system is that these nodes, they have partial knowledge. There is basically the problem. And there is a lot of uncertainty about what's going on, what's the actual um, state of the system, and so on. So, Distributed system literature will try to go around all those things and try to solve or provide or offer algorithms to handle these problems, like partial knowledge, for example. And something I saw is that this is a very deep rabbit hole. Once you start digging, it's hard to get out. So one question could be, what do we read? Where do we start? Which papers? There is one that is called the FLP paper because of the authors, Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson. And this, the official name is Impossibility of Distributed Consensus with One Faulty Process. Many people will tell you, if you don't read this paper, get out of this room. If you didn't read this paper, what are you applying to this position? You talk about distributed system and you don't know the FLP uh, impossibility, what are you doing? I don't think that's right, but this will happen. Or have you never read the part-time parliament, AKA Paxos? Yeah, maybe, maybe yes, maybe not, why? But that's another thing that you, when you start trying to hear the voices in the community, you will hear like, 
you need to know FLP, you need to know, need to know pixels or time clocks and the ordering of events in a distributed system. If you are applying or if you're a PhD candidate in a distributed system, uh, um, great. And you don't quote that paper, then I'm pretty sure your paper is rejected. Like every paper, I don't know, ask what the current time is just to quote that damn paper. It's everywhere. And it's kind of the starter of this whole thing by, by Lamport. Then there is this other one, for example, a simple totally ordered broker pro protocol. You know which one it is? Some people from that paper or related to the paper are exhibitors at the conference. That's the paper that introduces the ZAB algorithm, which is used by Kafka, for example. So another one that maybe you need to know, maybe you don't need to know. Maybe you just install Kafka. I don't know what's, how, how does it work, or Zookeeper, actually. And finally, one that was very popular, let's say, two, three years ago, is Raft, which is called In Search of an Understandable Consensus Algorithm. So there are all, the, all these papers. But you may wonder, okay, the day has only 24 hours. There are too many Netflix series I have to watch already. <laughs> like, you expect me to also read all this paper? Make them a series. Make them like this abstract. Make one about distributed systems. Maybe I read it. Otherwise, I don't care. And also, they have this sense of belonging. If you don't know this, you don't belong here. I don't know if that's correct, because there are many things that that can happen in a, day, in a developer's days, let's say, that may not involve any of that. Or you just need to be able to evaluate the difference between Raft and Zab to see if, if uh, Zookeeper or Kafka works for you, and that's all you need to know. Then there are a lot of books. I will give you a, a brief, a brief uh, not a brief, a brief uh, review of some of them. This is from my library. This is an IKEA furniture, as you can guess. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. The problem, just to give you an example, is Programming Distributed Computing Systems. This is from MIT. I bought that book. The title seems like it will help me to program a distributed system. It has nothing to do with that. The author starts presenting lambda calculus, goes to pi calculus, actor model, and whatnot. This define all those models. Second half of the book explains on very academic languages and implementation of the actor model and implementation of pi calculus and whatnot. But you are wondering, how do I program this thing I have to program? So it's very like you want to pull your hair. And then there is a whole why. I think the why is very well resumed in that picture. If for whatever the reason you need to implement a distributed algorithm, there is research already telling you what to do. Otherwise, you end up with that. And why I say this, I used to work, when I was working at uh, RabbitMQ, we have to fix the, the, the um, replication algorithm that Rabbit has. Um, it's not ideal to be charitable, let's say. And the problem is, when you come up with an algorithm from scratch like that one, what you are saying is, I am better than all the, the let's say, the PhD researchers like Diego Ongaro, the one from, from Raft, that they invested the time of a PhD with advisors, with all the input you get from a, a university at that level. And then you say, no, I will just sit this afternoon and code it, probably be over by the weekend. No, 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 you are not going to succeed. And there is no unless you are. No, there is no unless you are, because for, for Lamport, for Nancy Lynch, and many others, it was the whole of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, to understand just what consensus meant, and this FLP impossibility. So from my point of view, if you need to get deep and work on these things, read the theory. If you need to evaluate things, read the theory. Don't trust me. Don't trust my blog post, which, which is a, a resume of, of all this, um, a summary of all these uh, algorithms and, and, and techniques. Don't stay just at, at that level or, or the Hacker News uh, top post. Uh, Raft is not uh, good anymore. Use whatever. Oh, now we need to switch everything from Raft to new Hacker News top one blog post. No. 
So what's the problem I'm, I'm trying to tell you? There are different models on how the algorithm will be presented. One of them, <coughs> sorry, one of them is the timing model. Then there is the inter-process communication model used between these nodes and the failure modes. So algorithm will be based in one of these models. Let's say in the same way you can have OP programs, functional programming on whatever, you can have different timing models combined with different inter-process inter communication models and so on. And this is very important to understand if a particular algorithm actually suits your problem. On the timing model, there is the synchronous model. In this one, it, it says that a process knows exactly how long it takes for itself to uh, execute a step of the algorithm. It knows exactly how long it takes for that uh, message to go to another node in the network, how long it takes for that node to process the message, to reply, the reply goes over the network, you know the time, and you know the time to process it back. That's a synchronous model. Do you think that reflects the real world? No, exactly. Everybody, for the record, was raising their hands saying no. <laughs> so that's a synchronous model. Then there is the asynchronous model. At least for me, when I read this algorithm is using the asynchronous model, or we assume an asynchronous network, or asynchronous this, asynchronous that, I think in a similar way, like, let's say, netty programming, or node programming, Node.js, where you send a query to the database, you don't wait for the database to reply back to you, you keep doing things, when the reply comes back, you handle that query or whatever. That's how I understood asynchronous, asynchronous, that particular world. In distributed system literature, that word means that there is no guarantees how long you will take to process a step, how long the message will fly over the network, how long the other node will take uh, executing that step, replying to you, coming over the network, and so on. So at this model, there is no timing guarantees is closer to the real world, but it's not, it's not useful to us to know that uh, an algorithm may not literally not ever finish because we have customers waiting for our replies. Let's say we are Amazon or whatever, and we need to know what, what's, what's going on. So that's the asynchronous model. And then there is a semi-synchronous semi that this one kind of is not really popular in the literature, but it's mixing both. So that's, those are the models. Then inter-process communication, very easy. We, we either have message passing or shared memory. There's nothing too new here. And failure modes, this is very important. In failure modes, they analyze how processes will um, crash and will, uh, or fail and what happens when a process fails, when a, when a process, is, uh, process is wrong, doing what it shouldn't be doing. One of them is crash stop. The process will just crash, stop, be gone. If you are working with an algorithm that has crash stop model, it means exactly that. That process is completely gone. Do you think that's how it works in the real world? Like you, um, some machine fails, okay, just set it on fire because we don't need it anymore. No, we want it back. What it means is that in that case, the algorithm is able to keep running even though there are some failed nodes. And you need to understand the guarantees of, of, of this keep running with how many nodes it can still keep running and be incorrect. Always the, the main interest is, is the algorithm correct? Is the data replicated? I, am I not losing data? I, I'm seeing the right members on this network. Let's say you have a membership uh, system to say who is uh, online like which clusters are online or which nodes in the cluster are online. You want to be very certain about that. Here, what they are telling you, okay, if some process crashes, or at least n process crashes, we can still keep running the algorithm. Then there is a crash recovery. Processes can recover, but here, okay, from where? But if you have crash recovery, you know immediately you need to have some sort of storage. If there is no storage, you need to have um, 
a protocol for nodes to exchange the information. So the node that is recovering gets all the transactions that were missed. So all those things will tell you details about the performance of that particular uh, algorithm. If you need to, to store uh, things on the file system, maybe there will be a log. What happens if the log gets corrupt or how you replicate that log or all, all these problems they are trying to be solved in, in, uh, in different algorithms. If I'm not mistaken, I think uh, Raft is either crash top or just crash recovery, but stop there. Because there, are, there is also this one, like omission fault. Here, processes, they don't crash or they could crash, but at the same time, the algorithm is able to tolerate uh, faults to reply or or to send a message, like they have to act on the algorithm and send a message to some other node, they may fi fail to send the message or to receive uh, messages. And you may wonder, okay, what, what do I care about the difference? We can have a process that is omitting to tell the other nodes that it got re the replicated data, but it's able to reply to clients. So it's always receiving data. It means it's up to date, let's say a cache. And it's whenever clients contact that node, that they will get the latest info, even if it's not spe specifically, I mean, if the other nodes in the network may think that node is down, at least for the client, that node is useful. So omissions could be two kinds, again, to reply to other nodes, and to, to receive messages. If the node is not failing to receive messages, at least it's up to date. Just to name an example of something that could be useful for you. Maybe it's not useful. Again, this is all trade-off. If you want to have like a recipe or, or, a, or a thing that you click things and then it will output, you use this algorithm or that not, no. We have to think and read and understand all these things to choose the right uh, algorithm. Sadly, many times we choose them based on marketing, based on who has the bigger words, based on, on, on like, I was, nothing matter who, I was reading marketing material from some vendor out there. Uh, advantages, we are the fastest than everybody else. Okay, yeah, me too. Uh, here is, is the same. We need to see what we need, and we will see that mo uh, when we talk about consistency. Then there is the arbitrary fa failure mode. It's called Byzantine failures. Here is literally uh, living la vida loca by Ricky Martin. That's, that's what's happening here. Everything can happen. Everything can go wrong. Um, so nodes can lie to each other. A node can tell the other node, like, uh, I, I haven't been receiving your data. So the node start replicating again. What happens if, if something like that uh, may occur? You, are, you will see a loss uh, on performance because some node is, is trying to keep up with the rest of the system and trying to send all messages to this node that is lying, that is, doesn't have the, the, the up-to-date information. Or it can say, yeah, I, I received your data, now I start replicating to this side, and here I send wrong info. So. For example, I'm 35 years old. How old I am? How old I am? 35. He said I'm 37. That will be something in, in a distributed system. It could happen. That, yeah, he said 35. He understood I say 35. I said 35, but then to the rest I said, no, he is saying my age is 37. That's another failure that could be ha happening here. Then we have the wiretap. This is very common in the news lately. <laughs> there could be an adversary that for some reason is into our network. Uh, these guys and themselves as a, a Benin uh, node is doing the whole algorithm perfectly. There are no errors. There is no lies, nothing, but it's constantly collecting data. Some algorithms may try to handle that kind of failure. I think there is a report uh, by Yahoo that they tried to study all their faults on their production systems, and they saw that up to crash recovery was useful to invest for. Of course, depending on your problem, maybe you have a very sensitive information, like in payment security and whatnot, that you really want to make sure this is handled. But I guess for the average mortals, maybe up to crash recovery is, is good enough. So those are the failure modes. 
then algorithm, this is, it's not, I mean, not too interesting, I say, but there is liveness and safety. Algorithm will have those properties. There is a paper that uh, explains all these concepts. Safety is basically saying some bad thing does not happen during execution. Okay, what does that mean? Communication links should not invent messages out of thin air. That's a safety guarantee of the algorithm. It will tell you that links are not coming up with messages out of nowhere. Queues will send messages in the order first in, first out, let's say. Some stuff like that. And liveness is the other way around. A good thing happens during execution. Basically, a destination process eventually delivers the message. Also, they assume these things. When you see a paper and it's telling you eventually it will deliver, it doesn't say when. But the reasoning to say this algorithm is correct is because they assume at some point the message will come with an answer. So it's hard to balance. So if we look at SLP, uh, impossibility of distributed consensus with own faulty process. Uh, Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson. Nancy Lynch, uh, she's like the grandmother, I would say, of distributed systems. She wrote I would, what is kind of the Bible of distributed systems. I, I will tell you which book is that later. But anyway, the abstract says, the consensus problem involves an asynchronous system of processes, some of which may be unreliable. The problem is for the reliable processes to agree on a binary value. So basically, it's, we need to commit a transaction, to name an example, do we proceed or we roll back the transaction? That's the binary commit, not commit, the binary value they need to agree. And they show that every protocol for this problem has a possibility of non-termination, even with, just, with only one faulty process. And they keep talking about different solutions. But very important, a synchronous system of processes there is no timing guarantees, even infinitely. It's not like later, tomorrow, some admin restarted the system and then it came back. No, there is no guarantees on what happens there. Then they say, in this paper, we show the surprising result that no completely asynchronous consensus protocol can tolerate even a single unannounced process death. They don't consider Byzantine failures and they assume the message system is reliable. Yes. That's the real world. And delivers all messages correctly and exactly once. Also very, like I would say this is science fiction already, on the terrain of science fiction. Nevertheless, even with this assumption, the stopping of a single process at an inopportune time can cause any distributed commit protocol to fail to reach agreement. So. Why does it, ma it matter what they say? Why it's important that they say there is an asynchronous, uh, completely asynchronous network, that uh, the message system is reliable, the messages are delivered exactly once, we know this is not kind of true. Why? Why do you think they do that? Because even with those assumptions, it doesn't work. In the real world, it will even less work, let's say. When we have a system like the synchronous uh, model, which is completely not real, they prove there that some things are only possible to be implemented under those assumptions, like you know exactly all, the, all these time slots. Without synchronicity, all those guarantees are gone. You cannot solve this or that problem. So maybe we are trying to wing an algorithm, say, yeah, we'll do consensus or whatever, and we don't consider all the things. So we don't consider that under the assumptions we have is not solvable. Oops, sorry. So the question you may want have is, what consensus anyway is a paradigm of agreement problems? The properties is that they have termination, that is every correct process eventually decides on some value. Validity, if a process is I V, then V was proposed, proposed by some process. You cannot vote on a candidate that was not proposed, basically. You cannot vote for me for the election here because I'm not on the ballot, something like that. Agreement, not two correct processes decide differently. 
So all, if the algorithm was, was run to completion, everybody was correct, everybody agreed either on commit the transaction or on abort the transaction. And then there is a uniform consensus which says no two processes correct or not decide differently. But this is a different kind of consensus. It has already uniform there. Generally, people talk about just that one. So when do we need consensus? When a set of processes have to agree to take a common action. For example, if you talk about atomic broadcast of group membership. Why I mention this? Because maybe you think you are not implementing consensus. You just think, I know I just need to do atomic broadcast or group membership, like know who, which nodes are part of the, of the system of the cluster. And you start calling something away, yeah, I will ping nodes. If the nodes die, I will try to do this or that and whatever, update the data structure, notify everybody that this node is down. But actually what you are trying to implement under the hood is consensus. And they are kind of saying or telling that uh, consensus is not solvable in an asynchronous network. What is atomic broadcast is to when the correct processes deliver the same set of messages in the same order. Usually when you need to replicate, you need to have, like at RabbitMQ, you need to have uh, the order of messages as they are consumed by consumers, as they enter the queues, and uh, if they are canceled by a consumer, how it goes to a different consumer, stuff like that. So if FLP is telling us that consensus cannot be achieved, then atomic broadcast or group membership cannot be achieved either. But there are people selling products out there, so there is somebody is wrong here, either me, them, somebody. We pack our bags and go. No. There is a paper by this guy, Marcos Aguilera, it's called Stumbling Over Consensus Research, Misunderstandings and Issues. The problem with this paper is that this guy used to work for Microsoft, and that is not exactly the problem is that when he quit Microsoft, he web his website went away. So this paper, you can find it if you buy a book by Springer, you know the cheap books online from Springer. So there you can get this book with that paper. It's a book about replication. So what he says is an impossibility result in distributed systems is not the same as one in mathematics. Here, first, they are assuming a network where you can have a process that is never scheduled by the CPU. So because the process was never scheduled, it never come live and replied to, to the others, to name one example. And he says, yeah, that may not happen ever for your case. What they are saying is, if it happens, it will fail. That's one thing. Then, when you are dealing with the scale of, I don't know, Twitter, Apple, Amazon, Google, when you have billions of transactions per, per minute, I don't know, then probably you will stumble upon that failure. That's one thing. Then, they are not considering time, which that's the reason why there are failure detectors. These are uh, protocols or algorithms, let's say, to detect if another process has died. And if we introduce failure detectors, then we can solve the consensus problem. But as usually, or usual with distributed systems, there are problems. Everything is not so easy. So the seminal paper is this one called Unreliable Failure Detectors for Reliable Distributed Systems. If, you, if your tongue doesn't kind of fall in between pronouncing one of these papers, it's probably not a real one. I don't know how it works. So these are external processes to the algorithm, to the consensus algorithm, to name one. They provide information about suspected processes. They have a, compl a completeness property. It means that crash processes are detected. And accuracy. It means that correct processes are never suspected. What do you think about that? Do you think this is possible to implement? Like you never suspect of a correct process? Or crash ones are always detected? 
as we want to call it, is just wrap some perfect failure detector on your problem, it will be fine. No, it won't. This is the algorithm for, for the perfect failure detector. It has a strong completeness. It means eventually every process that crashes is permanently detected by every correct process. And a strong accuracy, if a process P is detected by any process, then P has crashed. The thing is, this algorithm requires a synchronous system. Without a synchronous system, you cannot have that. How, how can you detect a, with a accuracy that a process has crashed? You need to know exactly how long that process takes to process to execute a step of an algorithm. You cannot detect it uh, if you, like, is it running uh, JVM garbage collection? The network is slow. Uh, some other process came back, needs recovery, and I'm trying to replicate the log there, so I'm busy with that part of the system and not really being able to take care of the actual algorithm and reply back to the nodes. So is the process really crashed? It's just delayed? How do we know? With a synchronous system, that's very easy because every process has a specific amount of time to do whatever it has to do. But as we said, synchronous systems, they don't exist. The closest you can get is probably real-time system, like in cars or things like that, but in, in networking, I don't, I don't know. That's why there, there is another one which is called eventually accurate failure detector. Eventually, every process that crashes is permanently suspected by every correct process, and it has eventual weak accuracy, which means there is a time after which some correct process is never suspected by the other ones. So here, we may suspect a, a process, but then it may ping us back and say, no, hey, I was alive. I was just dealing with this other process that was too slow catching up, or JVM garbage collection kick on, and what can I do? I just need to wait until this is over. The other day, by the way, on, the, on, the, on Twitter, there was a discussion between uh, Shipilev and Gil Tini, I don't know how to pronounce his name, the guy from the Azul JVM, and they were arguing about the fastest implementation for garbage collection of uh, terabytes of, the, of RAM, like on the hundreds of terabytes of RAM, and they were coming up with algorithms that were doing this, let's say, in minutes. So <laughs> there are that kind of scale, by the way. Anyway, we can use these things to solve the, the consensus problem. And here, I think this is one of the biggest problems we may have in production. How long this timeout has to be? Uh, just increase the timeout, just put it two minutes instead of one, and then the problem will be solved. It's really hard to tell. It's really hard to tell based on, on everybody's uh, business requirements. We need to see. Uh, I mean, it's not the same to have like a front store like, like Amazon, let's say, between versus, I don't know, replicating uh, Cassandra nodes. It's a totally different problem. A customer cannot be waiting for a minute for some, with this wheel, they are loading, loading, loading all the time. So picking the right timeout, that I think is an important uh, problem. There was. Um, a patch inside RabbitMQ where somebody literally wrote uh, a sleep 50 milliseconds and see if the process came back. Why 50? Why not 51? Why, you know? It was very arbitrary and, and like ignoring all the things. So that's a paper. Another thing that you will see everywhere, this is also very important to evaluate uh, when you evaluate a, an algorithm, is the quorums. What kind of quorum the algorithm requires? That is, how many processes need to be alive for the algorithm to keep running? This is the weirdest wording you can find on a book about what quorum is. If you strip Everything basically says, if a majority of processes is alive, the algorithm can keep running. That's for crash fault, for example. The algorithm that currently ships with Rabbit requires all the cluster to be alive, and then it requires two round trips around the cluster for messages to be act everywhere. 
that's very slow. And of course, in these rounds around the algorithm, the, some of the nodes can actually crash, go away, network partitions, who knows. So what guarantees in the quorum or what properties in quorum the algorithm has will be very interesting when you need to choose because you know, okay, I need to at least have three nodes up to five alive all the time. Can our operations team do that? Some, those questions are the important ones, I think, when, when it comes to picking the right algorithm. I won't go over this. Then, final, final one is consistency. The discussion kicked out with this when this paper came out, this a correctness condition for concurrent objects. By the way, there is a book for Java development and I think .NET development by also this author, uh, Herlihi, Maurice Herlihi, that uh, explains how to implement concurrency on the, on the JVM level or, or the CLR. Um, I was discussing, for example, because we think, okay, distributed system, I have thousands of nodes, but maybe you can have thousands of CPUs and you will have similar problems. And I was discussing with a guy that designs hardware and he was telling me, yeah, when you have different transistors, or let's say gates, they also need consensus. And even what was weirder for me was to, to understand that the hardware will, will do like a, a a signal that will traverse the whole circuit and then it, it kind of synchronize every gate. But in between these pings that go around the, the gates, they can go out onto whatever state they want. What was shocking for me was like, even computers are broken at the most basic level and we try to make them work in a cluster of thousands, I mean, or, or hundreds, whatever, it's, it's amazing. Anyway, linearizability. To explain this, they use a concurrent uh, FIFO queue. It could be any other data structure, but they use this one. Because when you have a concurrent FIFO queue, you know what you expect. You, you expect first in, first out uh, behavior. You also want to define what happens if there is nothing in the queue. You block forever or you return an error. Besides that, then they try to analyze what happens when many processes either push items into the queue or they, or, or, or they take items from the queue. In which order those items go to the different processes that are seeing the system in action. So that's how they analyze concurrency. You need to think about a data structure and what happens when many viewers and, and readers and writers go into the data structure. So there is atomic consistency the sequential consistency and causal consistency. There are more. There is a very good talk by Martin Kleppmann. Uh, he wrote a book also for O'Reilly, also very, very good. I'm not the one to chat chat. Uh, and in his talk, he goes very deep into all these uh, subjects. And Kyle Afir Jepsen, whoever, however you, you know him, has this blog post. He's also very good explaining all these concepts. But basically, what you have is you have a linearization of the executions, pr process P, I, J, and K. They will be either writing and reading from, a, let's say, an atomic registry, and somebody that's watching this from a distance, it will see that this write was executed atomically here, the read was executed atomically here. These two operations, they are concurrent, but this one was linearized first, then the other one, then we have the read, then we have the read. What does it mean? Why or how do we know if this is um, consistent from a linearizability point of view? Because it doesn't matter that this one started first than this one. What matters is what happened when it got executed. And this write for three happened before the two write. So it's consistent because this read also sees the two and this one sees the two. If here we will be seeing a three, that from a linearizability point of view will be inconsistent. So a process basically reads 
it has to read the value that was written when this, the last operation finished, and then it cannot read, let's say, older values, like here. Even if this process wrote three, it still has to read two, because somebody else wrote this. But on sequential consistency, it, it only matters what I see from my point of view. It doesn't matter the order of the whole system, it matters what I see from my point of view. So if I'm uh, commenting on, on Facebook, my comments are in order. They don't need to necessarily be in order with everybody else's comment on that photo, let's say. That's uh, very important because linearizability is very expensive. All the coordination that needs to happen for this to be correct. There is another execution here, if you want to see. There's two happens first, then the three. That means these last two reads read the three, because the linearization was, uh, happened differently. But for the other processes, after those writes were executed, the, the thing is still consistent. Um, Kyle is testing for this kind of linearizability. So if a, if a project fails the Jepsen test, it doesn't mean we need to set it on fire, go to the startup that wrote that, that uh, database and punch the developers. No, it may perfectly work for a different use case. As in sequential consistency or causal consistency. In causal, I just need to see that uh, the picture I'm replying to is there. I cannot be commenting on a picture that is not there. Or, or if somebody replies to my comment, then the causation from reply to my comment, my reply, and picture needs to be maintained. But maybe it's, uh, on different sides of the world, there is people that also commenting and also arguing about different, um, um, like somebody posted a comment, this is totally crap, and then somebody replying to that one, but we didn't see that yet. What it matters is that we see our comment and the replies to our comment in order. So maybe we don't need to invest in that. Maybe that's not the problem we have. It's very nice to say, oh, argue all night about what Kyle found and what he saw in his blog post, and it's really cool and really helpful, and it's, it's pushing the level of the distributed systems uh, higher. That's really good. But we need to understand what is, what is he testing. Because maybe we say, ah, oh, this database didn't pass the test. But maybe it works for a different use case. That's uh, really hard to evaluate. And finally, books. Because probably you want to say, OK, you talk a lot, but what do I do now? This book, because I was working in Erlang, OK, I said I need uh, to learn all these distributed system things. Erlang is a message passing language. And I say, OK, distributed algorithm for message passing system, this is what I need. Ooh, no. When you reach the last page of the book, the guy says, um, we don't consider failures on this book. OK, so here is where I saw it was a scam. Because then he said, but I brought this book. <laughs> So, yeah. so I, I bought them all just to see what was there. I mean, by the way, this book, if you want to know what, is, uh, what are the atomic, um, sorry, what are vector clocks, uh, lamp port clocks, uh, the version vectors, uh, how to build spanning trees on a distributed system, how to prevent locking, uh, atomicity or, or linearizability, sequential con consistency, all those concepts are very well explained there. If you already know those concepts, OK, maybe this book is not for you. If you don't know any of that, it's a good book. But then there, is, there are fault tolerant uh, agreement or consensus algorithm, but there is synchronous there. It requires a, 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 these are algorithms for a synchronous network. So then he has this other book. <laughs> it's really a scam, I tell you. <laughs> I fall for that count. So. Uh, then this one, yeah, is for fault tolerance, asynchronous distributed system. Much, much better. This is the Bible I mentioned earlier by Nancy Lynch. Some people say it might be a bit outdated. 
A problem I think it has today is that the formality used to explain the algorithms is a IO automaton or something like that that almost nobody else uses. So you will be learning things with an explanation and a model that is not really in other books. If you want to buy one book, probably buy this one, Reliable and Secure Distributed Programming. And it's one of the few books that have the secure uh, word in them. Like they also have cryptographic algorithms for consensus or replication or whatever. So yeah, this book has all these different models very well explained, then started describing consensus uh, algorithms from different levels. Again, everything here, if you really want to know the theory of the what's behind, you want to get an algorithm, a paper, and say, yeah, I understand what this guy is talking about, or this person, woman, whoever is talking about in this paper. This book will, like, if they find you with this book on your, on your backpack in the States today, you probably get deported. Why? Kenneth Berman, in the 80s, he created a protocol which was used for controlling airplanes, and it was called um, ISIS. So if you start Googling about the ISIS protocol and this and that, you know, maybe somebody will pat you down and things. But the second half of this book has a very good discussion of why we have Paxos, why we have FLP, why we have uh, view stamp replication, why there is his algorithm. What are the differences? What are they trying to solve? Because in the 80s, everybody was trying to solve the consensus problem. Then Lynch came with FLP and said, yeah, this cannot be really solved, or only in this way can be solved. So then they move on, and then came all the algorithms. But in the 80s, everybody was investing money on solving a problem that was not solvable until the FLP thing came out. So second half of the book is very, very good to understand all this consensus thing and how they play together. But don't search for the ISIS protocol that was used to control airplanes, OK? This is like C groups or J groups. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's that thing. <laughs> Replication. This has the state of the art back then. <laughs> Let's say 2012, maybe. Here, you can find this paper by this guy from Microsoft, Aguilera. There are papers by um, Barbara Liskov. Um, chain replication, whatever. It's very, very good, this book, all how it goes in detail into every algorithm. Then a problem you, will, you saw in the talk that I'm always uh, linking to the ACN. There you have to pay for the papers. First, I think investing $200 a year, if you can do that, if you can spare $200 a year on your career, which is like being able to access paper, for me, it's been very worthwhile. I don't know, for, for, for you. That's one thing. Sometimes companies, they have company-wide uh, accounts for the ACM. That's also cool. Sometimes you can put it on your education budget. Otherwise, contact the academics. They really like to be contacted because they, they told me, like, OK, somebody's actually reading my paper. So here you have it. Uh, read it. So conclusion. As you can see, there is a very deep rabbit hole. Something I really like is computing science, where science is still a thing. You cannot wing it here. You cannot say, uh, I came up with this solution. Okay, like I have the fastest thing ever, like some people is claiming out there. Okay, prove it. And really prove it. Otherwise, there's the door there. The history of the field matters. You cannot say also, I came up with a novel, like, OK, who did you check before? Did you read? No, I didn't compare with anybody else. OK, then it's probably not novel. And read, read, and read. Thank you very much.